Hi there, and thanks for joining us for Mastering the Next Generation of Pennsylvania Science Standards. My name is Francis Vigent. Uh, I'm CEO here at NOATAM, and my background is as a high school math teacher and as an elementary and middle school STEM specialist. And I've been with NOATAM about 10 years now. And the, and the story around Next Generation Science Standards in Pennsylvania it's kind of interesting because Pennsylvania was not one of the 26 lead partner states in actually developing the standards. And there's a bit of skepticism around what uh, future role the next generation science standards will play in Pennsylvania in the short term, particularly for financial and political reasons uh, in terms of their, actu their being adopted as the formal standards for Pennsylvania. However, there's also a great deal of enthusiasm amongst teachers who are more or less driving a process to address the current uh, Pennsylvania state standards through uh, adopting uh, next generation science uh, approaches to those standards as well as curriculum and resources. So, so it's kind of an interesting um, uh, landscape right now in comparison with the uh, other dozen plus states who have already adopted and a number of others that are uh, either adopting adapted versions as their own in a couple of cases or who are waiting for their uh, legislative cycles to uh, basically hit where they will adopt the next generation science standards as the next set of standards in their state when that review cycle comes through. So nonetheless, not, not that you need a whole lot of history on the next generation science standards across the country, but, but Pennsylvania is kind of an interesting case. In terms of no Adam and where we're located and what we do, um, basically uh, we're located 20 miles north of Boston in Salem, Massachusetts, and we are a group of teachers who uh, are helping districts, or we have been developing uh, next generation aligned curriculum materials and professional development for some time, but our particular specialty is helping schools and districts reach high levels of performance uh, in the areas of science and engineering. So we're very excited about the next generation science standards because in aligning to those standards, the standards are really calling for a focus on higher order thinking particularly creative, evaluative, and analytical thinking. And furthermore, uh, placing students' thinking uh, and challenging students' thinking as being the primary mecha mechanism by which students learn science and engineering, uh, particularly by being in the role of scientist or engineer on an everyday basis in that classroom. So when you think about that, Curriculum materials, professional development look quite a bit different uh, than they did, uh, and then than they have you know previously, but than they do even in a lot of Pennsylvania classrooms right now. So it's it is an interesting time. It, for the next hour, uh, the four basic things I'd like to take a look at is what makes the standards a bit tougher, how they link to Common Core ELA and math, or just ELA and math in general, the uh, way that these new standards affect or modify or really require a, a change in methods of first K-12 science instruction in the classroom, and how those standards and the practices integrate across other content areas, in particular art uh, and the arts. So with that in mind, I think the first bit to take a look at is the, the basis of the standards themselves in the nature of science and engineering. One of the interesting things is that there's not widespread agreement uh, until now about what science is and isn't, what engineering is and isn't. And so uh, with the next generation science standards, we have the nature of science and engineering well defined that science is knowledge from experimentation. Uh, well, scientific knowledge is knowledge from experimentation, that scientists engage in asking questions and hypothetically answering those questions, testing their hypotheses through the development and use of experiments. And the data that comes from those experiments is how scientists form evidence-based conclusions. Engineers use that scientific knowledge to solve problems. So they identify and solve problems by prototyping, testing those prototypes, and using the data to decide whether or not the prototype needs to be refined 
or can be replicated. So engineers solve problems by producing technology. That's their role, and that's where technology comes from. Technology helps scientists answer uh, and, and ask, frankly, become aware of new and different questions. And that knowledge helps engineers solve problems in new and different ways. Now, within science and engineering, of course, there's an iterative nature that you don't always answer your, your question right away uh, or in the way that you think. Same thing with engineering. You don't always solve the problem uh, in the way you think initially. It requires uh, learning and pivoting and learning and pivoting until the problem solved. And then as science and technology is a kind of a cycle of innovation, as this, as this nature of science and engineering is interacting over time, um, innovations occurring so the way that problems can be solved tends to change as well. When you think about going from glass bottles to plastic bottles and things like this, once knowledge exists of things like polymers, uh, plastic solutions become an option. So nonetheless, so, so there is this kind of synergy and cycle that's part of the nature of science and engineering. And it's something that, that uh, teachers need to be aware of, but also students and really need to be able to not only understand, but engage in um, a role within this and, and be able to see themselves um, playing the role of scientist or engineer in that classroom and being able to articulate clearly why they're engaged in science versus engineering and so on. The reason you see math in the center is that math is a tool for communication. It's how scientists and engineers quantify, uh, evaluate, analyze, uh, c and communicate information. And that's true within their plans. It's also true within the data they gather and how they use that data to um, support an evidence-based conclusion. So math is a vital tool for communication. One of the, one of the most meaningful changes um, under the Next Generation Science Standards, uh, not, only, not only would this be the case for Pennsylvania, but uh, really nationwide, is a shift away from the traditional model of science instruction, one where content flows to a, through a teacher whose role in the classroom is to be the expert, modeling facts, demonstrating phenomena, and explaining what these different ideas of science are all about. In that traditional model, a student is really acting as a sponge, trying to absorb all of what's being shown so that they can recall the facts, repeat the demonstrations, and summarize the phenomenon. And when you think about that, it's all very lower order thinking, and the teacher is between the student and the content. And the reality is, is that you could replace the teacher with, you could uh, textbook in there, you could put video, basically something that's handing out knowledge uh, and in essence um, trying to be a proxy for a student's experience with that content. And so you can imagine that the next generation science standards, which are performance expectations, are best taught in a next generation kind of model where the teacher plays the role of coach instead of expert and helps the students to develop skills and use those skills to develop and use content. So the teacher is actually strengthening the connection and relationship between the student and the content. And so the um, the role of the teacher as a coach is really to adjust supports for that student, help them understand how to engage appropriately, communicate the expectations of what uh, it is to engage or how you engage as a scientist or an engineer, and then release that responsibility so that uh, students aren't following, but instead they're creating. And they're doing so in a very 21st century way in small groups uh, bringing their ideas to life, you know, two students m meeting of the minds, bringing their ideas to life, and teachers acting as uh, as facilitator for Socratic dialogue, as somebody who's redirecting and monitoring those small groups, and providing accountability at checkpoints all along the way as students engage in the scientific or engineering process, engineering design process. So you can imagine that learning in this type of environment the expectations of student proficiency are much higher, and they can be much higher. So a student demonstrates proficiency by demonstrating the expectations. 
what that means is they're able to develop and use the content with their skills. They're able to use the skills to solve problems and answer questions. And they're able to use the system behavior to understand, relate, and describe the dynamic interactions between different elements of content. So the next generation science standards, some of these terms that I'm using, the content is the disciplinary core ideas dimension. There's three dimensions. So the content's disciplinary core ideas. The phenomena is what's considered the cross-cutting concepts. And the science and engineering practices are the skills. Now, this is a little different than what you would see uh, presently in Pennsylvania in the 2002 standards, mainly because, um, well, for one, you have kind of grade span expectations. So by a particular grade, a student is expected to be able to for instance here, fourth grade, know the similarities and differences of living, of living things, identify life processes of living things, uh, know that some organisms have similar external characteristics and that similarities and differences are related to environmental habitat, describe basic needs of plants and animals. So when you look across all of these um, standards, the elements of the standards here, what you're seeing are things that are very oriented to, you know, towards lower order thinking, um, understanding, uh, remembering, understanding, and applying. So if you can remember the life processes of a living thing and you're asked a question, what are the life processes of a living thing, you can fill in that blank. Um, again, if you can remember the basic needs of a plant and an animal and you're asked, what are the basic needs of plants and animals, you can recall that. So, you know, as you start to go through here, um, you'll see that most of these are lower order thinking expectations. And, you know, um, that was appropriate at a different place and time. And so, as the uh, next generation science standards become, uh, you know, better known, nationally and within Pennsylvania, it would be a logical uh, step for Pennsylvania to adopt the next generation science standards to be able to bring in not just the sort of facts which exist now in these standards, but to be also to be bringing in the skills in the phenomena with the expectation that students will be able to demonstrate their understanding in a, context, in, in a relevant context in a contemporary related but unfamiliar context to that student so that what you're seeing are students who are equipped to extend their knowledge um, into the unknown and have the logical framework to do that and the skills to do that versus just being able to recall and analyze the basics. Now, when you look at the next generation science standards, they are they appear very different. So, you know, here's the documentation at present in Pennsylvania. When you look at the documentation for next generation science standards, it's very different. And the reason is that they are performance expectations. So as a result of classroom instruction, students are going to be expected to be able to demonstrate what they've learned in an unfamiliar context. And in order to do that, um, that context is requires uh, three dimensions as a minimum. And those minimum elements, the three dimensions are here in the three colored boxes, the skills on the left, the content in the center, and the, the phenomena on the right. You can think of it this way, that those are the, the minimum skills required uh, to develop and use the content in the center in order to observe the cross-cutting concepts on the right. And when a student is developing a model to describe the movement of matter among plants, animals, decomposers, and the environment, that's exactly what they're going to be expected to do. At a minimum, employ these practices, develop that content, and observe, and also, in particular, um, be able to describe a system in terms of its components and their interactions, the way that that phenomena manifests itself within ecosystems. So, so um, I'll show you in a moment what that looks like from an assessment perspective, because the, the next generation aligned assessments are a good way to show you what the expectation is um, 
in terms of student learning outcomes. But the, the biggest shift here is not only that students are going to have to demonstrate their understanding, but the involvement of science and engineering practices is something that uh, under a traditional model of instruction d just doesn't happen. Um, and so it's something that people nationally are struggling with. They're somewhat under the impression you can just do what you're doing and um, kind of stick practices in here and there, and it's just not the case, and here's why. Because at a high level, those science and engineering practices are the skills that students need to have developed in order to develop and use the content. So a student has to be able to ask questions in the context of science, define problems in the context of engineering, not only use models but develop them, and not only carry out an investigation but to be able to plan it beforehand, interpret data but also analyze it to get to those key uh, figures, use their computational and mathematical thinking to do that, construct an evidence-based explanation in science and design a solution to a problem within the context of engineering, argue from the evidence that they gather, and of course gather that evidence by obtaining, evaluating, and also communicating information. So when you look at these, you, in order to plan an investigation, you have to have asked a question. In order to um, analyze or interpret data, you have to have obtained it. And of course, constructing an explanation requires arguing from evidence. So all of these are interconnected um, within that context of engaging in science and engineering. So when you think about the, um, the connection between these new standards and other content areas, uh, constructing explanations and gathering data and arguing from evidence and so on, on the one side those are ELA um, standards and on the other side they're, these are math standards. Now, you know, the whole uh, development of the next generation science standards was after the development of Common Core. So there are obvious and well-documented connections that were intentional between the standards and the Common Core technical subject standards, communication standards, and writing standards within ELA. The students are also engaging in nonfiction uh, reading, nonfiction writing, uh, technical writing, process writing, evidence-based writing. Within the math context, students are engaging in all those math, eight math practices. The operations using their number sense, um, also the, beta, the basic data collection and graphing that goes on. So at the center of it all, uh, all disciplines benefit from the creative, evaluative, and analytical thinking skills, but what is science only is merely the experimenting and prototyping. Everything else kind of crosses over into different disciplines, and we'll talk about art in a little bit. And that's uh, how you see students, whether it's in second grade or in fifth grade, um, being pushed or really challenged to engage their thinking authentically in ways that are not um, known. So, uh, you know, for instance, these two students are engaged as engineers. In their class, um, they've done nonfiction reading, they had a Socratic dialogue, they came to a problem or question, broke into their groups. And at this point, these two students are trying to solve a problem that's related to what they know. They have some skills in order to do this. They have a knowledge of the, science, the engineering design process, so they have some logical uh, steps that they can take to try and pursue that problem and towards an evidence-based solution, but nobody has shown them uh, what the answer is, or there's actually more than one answer. They don't know it. They don't know exactly how this can be solved. They're going to have to think about it and, and try. And, uh, and by being challenged to try and solve the problem, they're going to be engaging in the content that they have been learning about, but also engaging the practices of science and engineering in developing uh, that solution. So right now, what you see in this picture is they're planning um, how they're going to solve the problem. Once they plan that, then they're going to carry out their plan, gather the data, and then form an evidence-based conclusion. So you can imagine that's well beyond remembering, understanding, and applying what they know. It's all about going beyond that and actually creating a possible solution uh, carrying out that plan, and then evaluating and analyzing the results, creating an evidence-based conclusion, and then 
at that point, they would have to evaluate whether they continue in the same path or whether they pivot or whether they um, replicate. So this is where engineering in this context uh, is iterative and nonlinear, of course. So the idea that there's an involvement of the scientific process or engineering design process, not saying that science or engineering is linear, but in fact what it's saying is that science and engineering uh, requires you know, logically pursuing a question or a problem as kind of a first step. And once you've gathered data, then you learn from that data, form your conclusions, and you pivot. Or you accept, you accept that as sort of the, the solution or, you know, final conclusion. But in most, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, there's some learning that occurs and then pivoting. And that's how science and engineering extends into the unknown and then becomes nonlinear. When you think about the difference between practices and processes, and I'll just show you here quick, that um, these are the processes of science and engineering, the logic by which you can pursue a question or a problem towards an evidence-based conclusion. I think about it as each, you know, going through these eight uh, logical steps, whether it's in the scientific context or engineering context, they saw they serve different purposes, but and are you know similar but different. But each time you go through this, it's like an inchworm, you know, kind of moving, taking that one inch step, and then once you've come to that conclusion, pivoting. So there's a difference between process and practice. Practices are skills; they're the tools to be able to engage in science effectively. The process is the logic. And uh, the parallel I always give is within ELA. When we teach children to write, we teach them the writing processes and practices. The writing practices are word choice, voice, sentence structure, tone. Those are the tools to be an effective writer. However, to write high quality published works, you need to engage in the writing process like brainstorming, pre-writing, um, drafting, editing, revising, then publishing. When you think about it that way, sure, uh, I suppose somebody could write a bestseller the way that you, and somebody writes an email with no process at all. However, to cr the, the, the best way, and perhaps most efficient way to produce a high quality published work is actually to um, engage in that writing process and use your tools that way. So the tools are useful for writing emails, they're useful for writing high, the, the, the uh, English language um, practices are useful for uh, writing out email as, as well as a, a New York Times bestseller, but to be able to get to that high quality piece and again not sort of be relying on luck, you need to use some logic. So. When you look at the current uh, Pennsylvania system of school assessment, where every Pennsylvania student's uh, being tested in grades four and eight and so on, these are the kind of questions you see. Uh, you see multiple choice like you see on the left. Use the drawing below to answer question four. Which type of information can the student collect using the tool in the drawing? So you know, A, B, C, or D. There's one correct answer. And if you can eliminate one or two, then you can increase your probability to 50-50, or certainly better than, you know, one in four. So if you know milliliters or a uh, beaker here, you have to do with the volume of a liquid, then boom. Just remember that and you get a right answer. In terms of open response or constructed response items, use the di drawings below to answer question 17. A student placed these two objects directly beneath a lamp for 10 minutes. Describe how each object was most likely affected by the lamp. So this requires a bit of analysis. So it is higher order thinking. You have to look at the lamp. You have to know that you know it's, we're talking about light energy and that when light hits a surface, it's absorbed and convert it into heat energy. And so the, both of these substances will be warmed or heated. There will be a thermal transfer. And then the crushed ice will uh, most likely melt. 
and the soil's temperature will just increase. I suppose it might, if there's any, if it's moist soil, maybe it causes it to dry out. But that's basically, I mean, that's that's the level of, um, you know, what we're dealing with here with the PSSA. But when you look at a next generation science assessment at virtually the same grade level, uh, so I'll use a grade five assessment from the District of Columbia because this is, you know, the one that is, it's been out for a little bit, it's been tested, it's now operational in not only DC, but the same test items are being used in Illinois. And, you know, most likely more to come. So uh, they're testing at grades 5, 8, and then high school biology, typically grade 10. There are multiple choice, so that's a selected response. There are constructive responses, which is uh, open response. And there are technology enhanced items, which are things you can do because it's a computer based test like dragging and dropping images. So this is an example of an open response, one of those constructive response items. You'll see that basically there's two fictional students in the role of scientists. They have an idea. They've learned about hydroponics versus growing in soil naturally. They construct a hydroponic device and then they have a procedure that they've uh, come up with in order to um, test whether beans grow differently in uh, water with nutrients versus the soil. And so they collect data at regular intervals and form an evidence-based conclusion. However, they really don't support their conclusions with evidence, and so they come to different conclusions. So the student who's being tested is asked whose claim is correct and to explain why that claim is correct using evidence from their analysis of the data given. So you can see here how basically the the um, the skills that a student is developing are required to be able to analyze this scenario is really what it is. And then of course to be able to, from a higher order thinking perspective, create their own claim, support that claim with evidence, and then reason it uh, in writing. And so it's, it's a lot uh, more than what we were seeing here where a student is just being asked to explain something. Here they're being asked to create, evaluate, and analyze a scenario. You can look further at other test items and you'll see that there's a kind of a theme that builds over time too with those fictional students. Here's one of those tech enhanced items to drag and drop different organisms into a food web. But then there's an open response item where the student has to explain how the model shows the shortest way for energy to get from plants to a fox. And so they'll have to describe that. When you look at number three, a student given a model of a pond food chain and there's a multiple choice. But in this case, um, they have to select the three correct answers. So eliminating one, as we saw you could do with this uh, multiple choice over here on the current PSSA, you know, if you can eliminate that this isn't measuring mass, and if you can eliminate that this isn't measuring temperature, you now have 50-50 odds um, because there's only one correct answer. Over here, you have to select all three correct answers. So that's very different. The value of just eliminating something because you can remember it is, um, you know, diminishes the value of this kind of test drill culture that, that happens uh, sometimes in schools. So once a student um, is through that, then they're doing things like, again, having an open response but using the model and extending it to how matter gets exchanged back into the environment, which the model doesn't show. So they have to be able to look at that and say, oh, well, you know, if a minnow dies because they're part of a, they have a life cycle, then bacteria will decompose that minnow and return its matter back to the environment where algae can use it as nutrients and then so on. It kind of re-enters. So when you think of it this way, the, uh, the expectation is students can analyze and ex apply what they know and basically extend it to this, you know, new environment they've probably not thought about minnows, perch, and bass before, but because they understand, you know, producers, consumers, and kind of the basics of primary, secondary, and tertiary consumers, then in life cycles and decomposers, then, you know, they're able to extend this to involve not only one food chain that's given, but another one where the, 
you know, remains of a minnow becomes basically food for bacteria as part of a life cycle and another food chain, and that forms a food web here. So it's really um, it's a very it's it's much more thought intensive. I hope is the big takeaway, and I, I won't go into these in detail. But on the left, you have a scenario. Another select three out of five multiple choice kind of theme building around composting and, and such. On the right, you see another scenario where there's particular criteria and um, a decision table, and the student needs to uh, decide which of the three solutions best meets the needs of the six criteria and to use evidence from that table to support their conclusion. So again, you see this claim evidence reasoning model. All of this is part of effective uh, science instruction. And it's one of the reasons why the Next Generation Science Standards are so different is that the National Research Council early in the process of developing Next Generation Science Standards um, really articulated what effective science instruction is. Effective, and this is what they said, effective science instruction capitalizes on students' early interest and experiences. So it starts in pre-K and kindergarten. It identifies and builds on what those students know. So it's um, in, intentionally nurturing, it's sort of thoughtfully building ideas from September through June, but also one grade level to the next, so it's a nurturing process, and provides those students with experience, experiences to engage them in the practices of science and sustain their interests. So when you think about students being engaged in the practices of science, that's what you see in the picture on the right. Students engaging in the skills specific to the discipline of sci disciplines of science and engineering and actually using those skills to develop and use the content and observe the phenomenon. And by doing that, they're bringing their own ideas to life and sus it sustains their interest because it's their ideas, it's um, challenging their thinking. And also, as you move through that type of environment, so go away from what you see on the left in that picture, that traditional model of somebody, you know, a teacher showing everybody what to do and then all the students kind of trying to remember all of the steps and how you do this and then go and repeat it for themselves. You know, that's not engaging in the practices. Challenging thinking and doing something uh, engaging in something for the first time, not from a model that somebody else has given you, but from one you're constructing yourself, um, is really engaging and lends itself to a, ser you know, a rigorous curriculum, a series of, of um, rigorous lessons over the course of a month and from month to month. One of the models we've developed over time is really, and I guess you think of more of like a middle school context, uh, as well, it's it's maybe a little easier to picture, but it's it's not taking a literacy-based approach to science, but in fact, using nonfiction reading to anchor concepts in reality, and then what you do is you take, uh, you know, that nonfiction reading and use it as a bit of nonfiction background. Okay, so this is a very small piece of of the time on learning that you have available in a week. And again, thinking of lessons as not happening in one day, but over the course of a week. So that sets the stage. The nonfiction reading sets the stage for Socratic dialogue. So there's no lecture. Instead, what you have is um, teachers asking higher order questions and causing the students to have to think about a context and respond by creating, evaluating, and analyzing that context with their, you know, as they respond. So Socratic dialogue um, helps students make concept to concept, concept to self, and concept to world connections from what they've read, and also with what their peers share, because that's the nature of Socratic dialogue. But at some point, you can switch from that Socratic dialogue to a problem or question, um, which can even artfully evolve from that conversation, and break the students down into their teams so that they uh, can work with like one other student, so you know meeting of the minds to plan an investigation, um, which is a way to test to you know, um, develop a solution to that problem, or uh, test a hypothetical answer to the question. So. Students plan those investigations with full release responsibility. They, that needs to be something that's worked up to in the first 10 weeks of school. But with full release responsibility, yet having accountability to the teacher at checkpoints. So they're, as they're meeting different stages in that scientific or engineering process, they're coming up and checking in. 
And so that's a, that's a key piece. Now, um, they plan their investigation, they're checking in, and at some point they have an entire plan so they can carry that out. And by carrying out their plan, they're actually engaging in science or engineering and gathering data, which they can then use to form conclusions. And those conclusions are claims based, you know, backed up with evidence and well-reasoned, and they can share those and debrief as a group to see different approaches. So it's a very, um, you know, a very clear way uh, of establishing purpose for science and engineering in the classroom, anchoring it in reality, and then helping students to understand the difference, um, you know, in purpose of what they're doing. One way that you can see that happening in a month uh, over the course of, like, you know, let's say two, three lessons, and this is an example you can um, check out you know, this is from grade seven, but you can go to our website, noadam.com, and actually check out what these types of lessons look like uh, in terms of the resources. And so th there's like a month of uh, sample uh, curriculum for each grade level that you can check out. Now, in the first lesson of a unit, uh, for instance, uh, students can learn about water cycle, uh, earth materials, groundwater, aquifers, um, and how these all interact. And transition from the reading and Socratic dialogue into a question around which earth materials are most permeable to groundwater, and then work with their partners to develop an experiment where they um, use available materials and construct a procedure to test those materials to find out which actually is most permeable to groundwater, gather the data, and form an evidence-based conclusion. However, the next lesson takes that further. So they can debrief and share out and compare answers and all of that and discuss, but then the next lesson focusing on pollution and thinking about um, surface pollution and air pollution and all the different types of pollution and where it's found and so on, and then connecting that to the water cycle, earth materials, and groundwater and thinking about how pollutants make their way into aquifers and can travel great distances uh, to wells that affect um, uh, humans as well as livestock and you know and others so even plants if it's for a for a golf course or something but nonetheless so when you think about this yeah, what you're doing is is you're taking the, the scientific knowledge and extending it to a real world problem and now there's a there is a springboard for students to um, engage in engineering by trying to solve the problem of a fictional town that needs a low cost water filtration device that costs less than five dollars and uses three different types of materials to remove non-point source pollution sediments from storm water runoff. And so taking that problem, taking what they know about it, and engaging in the engineering design process to look at what available materials there are, think of a few probable solutions, and then pick one, diagram it, build it, test it, gather the data, and use that data to form an evidence-based conclusion. That's what you see here. So you can see science and engineering coming together and you know, kind of playing off one another in close proximity. So each of those types of investigations are an assessment in and of their, their own. Uh, they're summative and formative. They tell you where a student's at, what they know, where their skills are at in the moment. And if your curriculum is really well articulated, They also can inform instruction the very next lesson in unit because those concepts are going to be carried forward and the practices are going to be used again and the processes are going to be used again just in a new context. Now, other types of assessments, um, like what we saw with the standardized assessments, the kind that take place in the classroom, should also be well thought out, sort of scenario based and with different layers of questions to tease out the different sort of aspects of the expectations of science and engineering in those three dimensions. And I mentioned about sort of the, the connections to ELA and math. Um, I think the larger thing to think about here is that um, when you think about something like math practices, making sense of problems, persevering and solving them, reasoning abstractly and quantitatively, constructing viable arguments, attending to precision, and so on, all of these are, you know, 
things we almost kind of take for granted that students would be engaging in in any environment, but they're absolutely necessary for math. They're uh, absolutely necessary to be engaged at a high level in science as well. One of the challenges around a lot of this is that the resources that are available are uh, resources which tend to be, at least at this point in time, low-level resources that are focused on uh, really awareness and you know as maybe as high as performance readiness, but uh, there's tend to be more at the bottom and less at the top, and it makes sense why. The awareness ready resources are kind of free, simple, two, three page kind of downloadable resources you might get from companies and museums. As a result of using them, students will know what an engineer or scientist is. You know, they can raise their hand to answer. You know, engineers engage in solving problems. Knowledge ready resources are like textbooks. They are the kind of resource that helps students. Uh, know what scientists have discovered and engineers have created to solve problems. It's kind of backward looking uh, paragraphs to explain words kind of a thing. Performance ready resources are the kind where you have these kit units where you, know, you have a kit of materials and then um, you know you spend three months learning all about rocks and minerals and at the end you know, you know at some intervals you uh, have culminating activities where students um, take what they know and they see that it works because they follow a procedure somebody gave them or a worksheet and they scratch the different minerals to see their properties. So they learn how to carry out that task of a, of a scratch test or a streak test. Mastery readiness really points at um, equipping students with skills to be able to evaluate and analyze context by extending what they know and f being able to uh, make claims which they then uh, back up with evidence that they have uh, been able to gather from analysis of the facts at hand and also uh, to reason that, reason that in writing. And, and so, you know, the, the, there are all kinds of extensions of that, what we talked earlier, the, the ability to plan. Um, the ability to make use of structure and so on. An example of mastery readiness is, you know, uh, um, a student should be able to take their knowledge of the properties of different materials and uh, be able to analyze, let's say, a, a context or engage in a context where there's somebody who is designing a kitchen, a commercial kitchen, and it has to design that to certain specifications of durability and you know cleanliness and such things. And so there may be you know twenty different materials available for countertops, each with many different properties, whether it's color, hardness, um, melting point, um, you know scratch resistance, whether it uh, can fracture, whether it's porous, and so on and also each with a different price. So a student should be able to evaluate the criteria for durability and the needs of su such an environment as they're articulated and perhaps even extend those uh, with their own understanding and then look at the available resources and analyze their properties and form a claim around which material would be best fit to suit the needs of the countertop in the commercial kitchen because and, and again, because, you know, give evidence uh, to support that claim and reason it in writing. That's what mastery readiness is for, is skills that can be generalized, knowledge that can be generalized to solve any problem or answer any question, um, you know, obviously within reason. I mentioned art, and some folks talk about this idea of STEAM, and STEAM being an extension of the acronym STEM, STEM an acronym standing for science, technology, engineering, and math, and of course, STEAM adds art in there. Now, what's interesting is the next generation inquiry environment is a culture of critique. That's the same type of culture that artists are trained in, whether it's formal or informal training. And um, artists are often mistaken, especially in K-12, as being people who make things pretty or make pretty things. But in fact, artists are uh, people who engineer communication. And so they are uh, sending messages 
through what they create and targeting those at specific people or groups of people. And when you think about the practices and processes I was describing earlier and those all those skills, the um, the reality is is that we are equipping students to uh, be great communicators and uh, within a culture of critique in the science class such that they are also better creators and consumers of art and are uh, better able to communicate their ideas and you know targeted at specific audiences and such and an example of this example this sort of definition of art that I've given you is Pablo Picasso and his uh, m one of his most famous works Guernica now uh, this was created while Picasso lived in exile in, in France he uh, was commissioned to create a work for an international art exposition and he was appalled at the atrocities of the fascists committed at uh, Guernica a town in his home country of Spain and so he created a piece for the International Exposition titled after the town, Guernica, which showed all kinds of destruction, chaos, and atrocities um, against man and beast. And so when you think about this, uh, Pablo Picasso uh, was living in exile because <laughs> he was communicating through his art and in ways that, was, that were not uh, popular with the people in charge and which, you know, put him at risk. And furthermore, um, you know, he made a statement to the world through this piece. It's not particular. It's not pretty. It's not. It's not a, what we might consider a pretty thing. Um, but beyond that, it's um, it's a specific statement to a specific group of people. And as evidence of that, uh, you know, the fascists, after seeing this, came to Pablo Picasso and said, "What did you do?" And he uh, responded by saying, I didn't do it, you did. And so, you know, just in that simple exchange, you can see that it was intentional, that this, you know, is something that's being communicated, a, 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 really a work of art. So, so when you think of it this way, um, you know, it explains why artists are controversial. It also explains why artists, when there's not freedom of speech or expression, that they often find themselves in jail or persecuted and sometimes even killed. So, um, keep that in mind when you think about the connection between what's being learned in the science class and engineering class in the broader world, because frankly, um, these skills cross over all disciplines, but they also are an element of you know, quality of life and communication in society. When you think about the resources themselves, uh, you know, thinking about curriculum professional development materials, they really should fit hand in glove in the sense that um, one supports the other with the purpose of supporting that hands-on, project-based STEM learning environment where students are able to be in that role of scientist and engineer on a regular basis. And it's about equipping, you know, it's really about equipping teachers for the challenge and the classroom for the challenge and in such a way that the students can af effectively be put in that role. Um, so, so you know, the nurturing, the scaffolding, and all of this is, is part of it. When you take these types of uh, approaches and you apply them in the classroom, there's clear data that shows that even under testing that's not aligned, that students produce um, amazing outcomes. So, for instance, um, here's a fifth grade suburban community with 20% high need students and 7% low income. And the state average in Massachusetts, these are from Massachusetts, is 50% advanced and proficient combined and these students go from average to well above average, adding 20 some odd points over the course of a couple of years. And you can see they're sustaining that level. And uh, you know, they could, could they exceed these, this 80 some odd percent? Sure. But the reality is that um, it's kind of a, in the current testing in Massachusetts, there's a bit of a, a mathematical anomaly that if a student doesn't get every point in a constructed response item, then what happens is, um, those items are weighted more, or more, much more significantly than uh, multiple choice items. So, for that reason, not getting every point <laughs> on those translates into the, a typical average in the uh, low to mid 80s. So, um, it's not always the case. We have folks that are up in the 90s, but it's just as you scale, it's a little, it's a little trickier. 
when you look at other examples like urban schools, he has an example of a school with 35% ELL students, 42% low, 72% low income, 65% free lunch, and 75% high needs. They go from below that state average of 50% to well above. Over the course of two and a half years, they add 51 points, and so they're operating basically at 90, or uh, sorry, 87%. Uh, advanced and proficient at that point. Now, this is an urban school with big shocks, huge turnover in teachers, changes in administrators, and so on. In addition to having newcomers to the school and uh, student transients and all the other pieces. But the point I want to make here is that by teaching, by nurturing children from one grade level to the next, you're intentionally nurturing them with content and skills. So when there are shocks, they have something to fall back on. They don't fall all the way back to where they used to be. And when the kind of uh, shock sort of subsides, whether that's a new teacher's learning curve or whatever, then that performance can pick back up. And it, and it tends to pick right back up. So it's all you know, very positive. The, uh, another example, uh, an extreme example from uh, middle school level. So here's another example from Massachusetts. I'll use a example of a middle school that was bottom in the state in 2013, 4% proficient, and over the course of two years added 24% uh, to their advanced and proficient scoring students, and cut their warning and failing, those basic and below basic level students, basically in half. And um, that's key because what's interesting here is that as an urban school, when you look at the average performance of uh, urban middle schools in Massachusetts, in the 26 largest cities in which this school is one, the, the, this school is performing at average level. Now, from well below average, and hopefully this trend continues, uh, this is the most recent data available, and you know, those students then approach sort of you know, well above average. When you look at the challenges, though, um, you can see this is this is a very urban profile uh, for middle school. So it's 64% first language, not English, 15% ELL, 95% low income, 87% free lunch, and 97% high needs. So significant challenges, but nonetheless, um, big gains are possible. And we see similar things in other states. Here's an example from New Hampshire where our groups are in yellow and in purple, state averages are in pink and in teal. Again, it's not a uh, NGSS aligned test, but by taking these practices, processes, and the cross-cutting concepts into everything and, and teaching the next generation inquiry model, we're able to see 20-30% improvement over state average in just two years. Year one purple, year two yellow, across all these subgroups. So again, significant value even under existing um, standards and testing in more than one state. Uh, I will leave it there. I hope you found this uh, webinar helpful and the information useful as you consider how you want to uh, adapt and adopt the uh, innovations within the Next Generation Science Standards to further engage and enrich your students and also meet the needs of the current Pennsylvania Science Standards. Uh, another webinar you may want to take a look at is noadam.com forward slash strategically. It's strategically implementing the NGSS. You can also find it under the resource section of our website. If you have any questions about anything uh, I've discussed that you'd like to forward me, feel free to reach me. My name is again Francis Vigent. Uh, you can reach me through Mary Ellen DeLacy. If you do check out, uh, and her email is here, mdelacy at noadam.com, if you do want to check out any of those, uh, that one month of, of sample curriculum and readers on our site, you can check that out, noadam.com forward slash curriculum. We have all the others, but in order to keep our lights on, um, those are available for purchase with the materials and everything else. Um, but even as you, you know, decide whether you construct your own or whatever, feel free to take a look at these. There's one for each grade level at least shown as student and teacher piece. Case studies, you can check that out. Uh, and stay connected, noadam.com forward slash blog. You follow us um, there. It's all, all this is free, facebook.com forward slash noadam, or follow us on Twitter, at noadam's our handle. 
like I said, there's a bunch of other free live and on-demand webinars as well as ebooks and a plethora of other resources available on our site under the resources section, noadam.com forward slash resources. Again, my name is Francis Vigent. I appreciate your time and uh, attention. I hope that this has been helpful and uh, I encourage you, um, I, I hope you find that uh, it's helpful and en encouraging that the next generation science standards uh, are able to support even the existing Pennsylvania standards. I wish you luck in your endeavors and hope that you have a great day. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.